Okay, we're live, we're live. We're off the mark, we're good to go. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, happy Monday. Hope you've all had a, a lovely weekend. So we are back with um, with week six. On week six, we're absolutely flying through. Um, so on week six of our level two um, course, where we are looking to um, develop skills for not just employment, but also our personal fitness and well-being. I think, and I've previously said, you know, I think the last two years through COVID and lockdown and, and through the pandemic in general, you know, I think a lot of us have, have sort of realized or certainly really felt the um sort of the 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 pressure that only we've been able to take control of our health and well-being and our fitness you know um we we've been out of the office space where everybody else can see what you're eating for dinner and stuff like that so you know maybe you know there's there's nobody going to come along and say you know, when, when, you're, when, you're, when you're at home, just working at home, there's nobody going to come along and say, no, you shouldn't be having that for dinner. You know, that's not very healthy. You know, you might obviously not be getting inspiration from other people as well. Um, and the same goes for exercise as well. You know, there was a time where um, the only form of exercise we were able to get was getting out of the house um, getting, uh, and getting and go for a walk really as well. And again, there was nobody there to come around and make you do that. You know, our, our health and well-being fell into our own hands and our own responsibility. Um, all morning, Sue. Um, ho hope you're doing well. It's been, it's been a little while. Uh, ho hope you're doing good. Um, so so yeah. Um, it's 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 really helpful to be able to sort of look at those skills that help us manage our own fitness and our own health and our own well-being as well. Um, so with that said, let's get into it then. Let's get into it. So um. Just as a little recap from last week's session. So in last week's session, we um, we we looked at body weight exercises that you can use in a circuit training session, or just body weight exercises that you can do in general. Really, um, our aim, of course, is to um, bring them into our circuits and to be able to use our circuits that way. Um, but those body weight exercises that we looked at last week as well, you know, if you want to do a squat or a press up, it doesn't have to be in a circuit to, to do it and to get the benefit of it. You know, we, we talked about the benefits of circuit training and the fact that, you know, we can get a lot more in a shorter amount of time. Our heart rate remains higher um, and probably for longer across the duration of the workout, although the workout itself isn't as long. Um, you're maintaining that higher heart rate. Um, and like we've talked about before, time is a massive barrier when it comes to exercise. Having time to exercise, you know, is going to seem like much more of a challenge when you sort of thinking that you need to free up an hour or an hour and a half. When when really in a circuit, you can you can do quite a lot in twenty minutes. Um, so yeah, we've we've looked at the benefits of circuit training. We've looked at sort of exercises that use equipment that um, we could do in the circuit. And then last week, we looked at bodyweight exercises as well. Your squats, your lunges, your planks, your press-ups, um, amongst loads of others, of course. Um, and we, we again, sort of built on those circuit training cards as well, or our, our knowledge for the, those cards that we're going to start to do. Um, and just recapping, you know, making sure that each exercise we looked at, we had a name, we knew what muscles it uses, so we can put that information on our cards. Um, a picture of the exercise, you know, like a little, even if it's a stick man, you know, showing you where the weights should start, where they should finish, whatever it is that you're doing. Um, a little description, like so almost like a written, um, even just a couple of sentences, you know, pick the weights up, put them at, uh, uh, flay your elbows out to um, eye level, from eye level, push above your head, and then bring the dumbbells back down to, back down to eye level. Yeah, so that's for an overhead press. Um, health and safety considerations, which we're going to get into a little bit today as well, um, just while we're looking at how to maintain some of this fitness kit as well. You know, um, if we're using equipment, we need to make sure it's maintained, um, well looked after, and ultimately isn't going to break while we try and use it. Um, or cause harm to ourselves or other people around us as well. So we can um, sort of look into that in a little bit more depth in today's session as well. Um, and then just to finish up last week's session, we also looked at, you know, how do we make these exercises a little bit harder for people who are finding it too easy? And of course, vice versa, how do we make it easier for people who are finding it a little bit too hard? Because getting that level right is is 
is kind of a big, big step in keeping that person engaged and motivated. If it's too easy, I'm going to start to think, what's the point? You know, that was always my philosophy was if somebody's got out of bed at six o'clock in the morning to come for a circuit or on a Sunday, they've come to a boot camp at nine o'clock or whatever it is, you know, um, make it worth it. I wouldn't want to get out of bed to do an exercise and then feel as though the exercise has done me no good. You know, if I've got out of bed to do it, I'm going to make sure that I'm working and getting the most out of it. Um, and I expect that a lot of other people that are training are the same. You know, a lot of people will will verbalize and, and like they'll, they'll say to you, look, I'm finding this a little bit easy. Can you, you know, can we make this heavier? Um, or, or whatever it is, can we increase the range of motion or something? Um, and then, like I say again, when it comes to a fitness journey, a big part of a fitness journey, I think, is finding something that you sort of feel like you can cope with. It doesn't have to feel easy, but it has to be it has to feel manageable. Um, and again, if it's too difficult, you're thinking, oh, I kind of do this. I'm a little bit conscious, you know. I'm worried about my form. I'm worried about other people looking at us, and I kind of do it. Um, you know, that, that person eventually will stop coming. But if you can say, okay, you know, that looks a little bit heavy. Your form's going a little bit. Um, let's just make it a little bit lighter so you can maintain that good form and keep going. And you might get more reps in, you know, make it a little bit easier. That person is much more likely to sort of take the adjustment and dig in, especially with something that is more their ability level. That's where you seem, that's where you seem to find people working the hardest when you get them at the point where it's challenging, but, but doable. If it's impossible, who's even going to, who's going to try not very many, not very many. So yeah, um, big steps in being able to um, progress or regress and exercise as well. Um, okay then, so what are we going to cover today? So we are going to um, begin planning a circuit training session. Yeah, so of course for yourselves. Um, but I'm going to do like a little, um, like a mock one as well, I guess we could say. Um, and I, I could really show you how some of the processes I go through to put a, to put a circuit together. Um, so really, you guys start to plan your circuit training session, um, how to maintain different pieces of fitness equipment so we know that they are safe, not going to cause any harm. Um, that kind of links in with the step below, health and safety issues to be made aware of. Um, and we can maybe touch on skeletal muscles a little bit towards the end of the session if we get a chance. But we also will be looking at um, some examples of circuit cards that other learners have done in the past as well. So you maybe get some ideas, maybe get a little bit of inspiration. Um, of course, if you are enrolled on the course, if you've either been doing it online with myself um, or doing it in person with Mel, um, if, of course, you just sort of logged in, just sort of popping in, say hello, say what's going on, you don't need to worry too much about these circuit cards or, or anything like that. Um, okay, guys, uh, let's get into it then. Let's get into it. So I guess before we do go too far, as always, just to point your di attention towards the little um, description box below today's video, the link to workbooks are in there. So if you need, if you need your workbooks, they're in the description. There is, of course, a link to a fitness video, which you can try or follow that link anyway, and it'll take you to our workout playlist and you can look at all the workouts, maybe find something that sort of um, appeals to where you are today on this Monday morning. Maybe you want a little bit of a stretch. There's a stretching workout on there. Maybe you want to do some chair-based exercise where you can do it sat down. That's on there. Maybe you want a circuit like you can, um, and, you, and you can see some of the circuits that I've put together on there as well. So definitely follow that link, guys. Um, even if you're not feeling that video in particular, check out some of the other ones. And um, yeah, there'll be something uh, there'll be something for you. And of course, my um, email is in there as well. So in the off chance that you don't have that by now, my email address is in the description and um, below the video as well. Um, and the last thing to mention in there is, of course, the survey, guys. So for each session that we do, um, we need to do a survey. It doesn't even take 30 seconds to fill in. If you click that link again in the description, that'll take you to where you need to be. And then you can just type in your answers and hit submit. You know, you don't need to save it, download it, fill it in, send it back. None of that. Um, none of that kerfuffle. Um, just uh, hit, click the link, put your answers in and hit submit. 
And that's all we've got to do, guys. So, yeah, make sure we've done that for not just this session, but for each of the previous sessions that we've done. Um, and, again, let me know using my email. Um, <coughs> let me know if um, there's any issues with any of that. Sorry, that was just the dog. He's got his um, dog's back in his corner shame this week. So he's bouncing off all the walls again. So if you have a bit of banging, that's all that is. Um, okay, guys. So let's get into it. So when we're planning a circuit training session, these are some of the things that we're going to want to um, or need to think about um, in being the space that we have available. Sometimes you might have a full gym, you might have a full sports hall, um, it could be a field, you could be outside, you might be... Um, you might just have a little little room in a gym. It might be a studio room in a gym, which might be a bit smaller. Um, it could be a little personal studio gym, which is going to have even less people in it. Um, you know, I've seen gyms in converted churches, converted garages, converted warehouses. Um, you know, if there's a space where you can get fitness equipment, I can guarantee you it's been used as a gym somewhere, a basement you know, um, a spare room, a shed, especially through lockdown and stuff like that. So the space that you might have available or the space that might be available from session to session is going to be is going to be totally different. Um, and an instructor tends to try and utilize the space they've got. Good boy. Tends to try and utilize uh, the space that they have available, really. You're not going to have a full open gym and everyone's all cramped up in one corner trying to, you know, get around 10 stations probably be spread out a bit more so it's going to depend on the um on the space that you've got available but not just that but you've also got to think about the equipment that you've got um at your disposal um you know in in practice and in you know in reality we need to think about getting it there as well um how much space it it, it does take up um if you're in a gym you know you might find that the circuit and i mean the boot camp that we used to use that we used to do, we used to, um, the session used to run on a morning before the gym was actually open to members. So people would come in, pay for boot camp, do this boot camp where there was nobody else in the gym. So that meant that we could use the squat rack and the leg press and the boxing area um, and the spin bikes and, and, and everything. You know, we had sessions set up on the cables, sometimes using some of the free weights, um, preloaded barbells, resistance bands or whatever, because we had we had the run of the gym. Um, so yeah, we had even some of the some of the cardio equipment. So we had not just a skipping rope or you know some more cardio based body weight exercises. We had treadmills and like I say bikes and steppers and stairmasters and rowers. Um, so we were able to use that equipment a little bit more. Whereas I've also done circuits where you turn up to a sports hall and there is no kit and you need to bring your own kit. So obviously I don't have a treadmill and I certainly couldn't be sticking it in the back of the car every time I went out to teach a class. So it becomes more about, you know, smaller kit, kit that's easier to transport and maybe it's even a little bit becomes more about body weight exercises as well. You know, looking back now and reflecting on it, I feel as though we used a lot more body weight exercises in these classes where we didn't have the rowing machine and we didn't have the, you know, the squat rack and, and, and everything else. Um, Because, you know, we had to replace some of that equipment with some stuff. If you haven't got the treadmill to get somebody to run on, what do you get them to do? Get them to run up and down the sports hall. It's the same sort of thing. And there's not always a direct sort of substitution, but sometimes there will be. Um, so equipment that is available is going to be a big one. You know, you might be thinking about a circuit to do at home for yourself. You know, you might not have much equipment at all. The chances of, um, you know, having, you know, there's very few of us have our own sort of home gym. I don't have a home gym. I've got, I've got like the, the back room, which kind of doubles up as an office and a music room. And I'll clear a bit of space in there. Um, and do my exercise in there pretty much. Um, so again, I've mentioned before using a lot of resistance bands through training, but to do a circuit, you know, again, you might be just doing a circuit at home, you might be needing to think a lot more about body weight exercises. Again, um, you know, it, it, it might be a circuit that you're planning on doing out and about, 
You know, I've done circuits in the local park and then the equipment that you've got available changes. You look at things like benches to do dips on and step ups onto and, you know, all of that sort of thing. Um, press ups with your feet on the bench, little things like that, you know, just sort of using using your initiative a little bit. Um, so the equipment that you've got is is going to be um, is going to be a big factor. You know, again, you might be you might just turn up to the gym, peak time, five o'clock, half five on an evening. You want to do a little circuit for yourself at that time of day. You might just have to take the equipment that you can get. You know, it might be right. Okay, I've got myself this kind of little section of the gym. I've got a couple of dumbbells, but I don't want to take all of them because other members need them. I've got a kettlebell, but I didn't want to take all of them because other members need them. So it might just be a case of looking at what equipment you can get, what exercises are suitable with that equipment as well, and go from there. Now, in terms of planning your own circuit cards, we've got a little bit of a little bit of a win because um, it's 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 in theory, you know, it's a hypothetical class. So there is no transporting equipment around and there is no, oh, well, I haven't got that. I can't get hold of that. If you wanted to put certain bits of kit in your circuit, then, then, then you can do. We don't need to physically get our hands on it. In terms of actually putting a circuit together, though, these are things that we do need to consider and we do need to think about. Again, I've gone from, you know, going in the gym and planning to do like a leg circuit, lunges, squats, burpees, squat jumps, pulses, whatever it is to realising that I couldn't really get the equipment um, and sometimes you've just got to sort of shift your focus a little bit and end up doing something a little bit different. Because um, like I say, the, the equipment that, the equipment that you've got might vary from session to session as well. Um, okay, next thing to consider is, of course, the amount of numbers that you need, to, uh, the amount of members, sorry, that you need to cater for. If you've got... Um, you know, maybe there's a booking system in place. It can really help us, you know, be prepared for how many might turn up. I used to do it, obviously. It's different with, with, with a class like spinning because you only have so many bikes. So we had to do a booking system um, to make sure that we weren't overbooked. You don't want 10 people to turn up to get on the seven bikes. Um, but when you're putting a circuit together, again, it is it's helpful to know how many members that you're catering for. Um, again, we eventually started to use a booking system for all of our classes because it doesn't, from my perspective, it, it, it helped to know who was coming as well as how many were coming. Because once you get to know your, your regulars, you know, you know who's capable of what, you know what people respond to. You might look at a group one particular day and think, you know what, this group will be really good. I'm going to put some more strength training in there because, you know, the ones that don't like it aren't here this week. Um, and the ones that are here, I think we'll get a lot out of it, you know, so knowing who's coming, um, and, but especially the numbers, the, the big one with the numbers, kind of like a spin bike with circuits is you need to know how many stations you need to put out. If you've got 10 stations put out and there's only room for one person to be on that station at a time, you can only have 10 members. Yeah, in your class, you can only have 10 members there. Um, whereas if you put 20 stations out, um, of course, you can you can accommodate twenty. I used to regularly, um, you know, again, I would I would know who who was booked in, but I would always have a couple of spare ideas in case we ended up with a couple more. I have had times where I've been expecting six people for a circuit and eight turn up. You've got to, you know, essentially find two two new exercises and incorporate them straight away because you know you need to be good to go from when the class is ready to start. Um, that was again where I used to have like extra just circuit these cards that we're making. I used to just carry extra in my bag. So if I had to put a couple of extra exercises in, it wasn't all oh, what should I do? What should I, what exercises should I do? I would just go to my bag and get another two out. You know, I would just go and get another two. Um, right, okay, I'm gonna add in um some press ups. I'm gonna add in some skater jumps or whatever it is. You know, so knowing the knowing the amount of people that you're catering for can really help. Um, again, when it comes to equipment, if you know that there's only one person doing the circuit, then you're probably only going to need one set of dumbbells, you know? If you get to that exercise around there when you need the dumbbells, we'll just come and get them. If you've got two people doing those stations at the same time, though, you need more dumbbells, yeah? So you need to know how many people you're, you're expecting and, and what equipment you need um, 
to make sure that they're working. Again, sometimes it's handy to just have those those extra circuit, those extra stations to go in, you know, make them body weight. That's what I used to try and do. Um, make them body weight exercises so then you're not trying to find my extra kit and stuff like that. Um, you can just say, right, okay, I was expecting 10, 12 have come up. You do a plank and you do sit-ups. You haven't had to find any extra kit. You've just put two extra, sta- two extra um, stations down. Um, like I say, again, it might be totally different if you know that you're just... If there's only you going to um, be doing the session, you can plan things a little bit differently. Or if they, you know, you're planning a session for you and a friend or you and a mate. Um, so going into it as informed as possible can really help you make the best circuit possible, really, I think. Um, okay, then then we had mentioned last week that you may want to do a circuit that works just like one muscle group. So you might want to do a leg circuit or an ab circuit or whatever. Um, now, what we've got on here, and what I a lot of the time try to do, I wouldn't say all the time, because you know, there were times where I thought it, it was beneficial for it to be all legs or all abs, or maybe that was the specific class I was teaching. If I'm teaching an abs class and I'm doing a circuit, I'm going to pick abs exercises. Um but I did also try and make sure things like circuit classes, boot camps, metafit, stuff like that, making sure that the whole body was getting the workout. So I would normally pick very similar to this example that we've got here. You know, I would pick two upper body exercises, two lower body exercises, two for your core and four for cardio. There's 10 exercises, 10 stations, um, good amount of cardio mixed in there. So getting out of breath, making your heart and lungs work but then also work on our upper body muscles, our lower body muscles, and our core muscles as well. Yeah, so um, you might just start to divide it up that way. This is, I want two for upper body, two for lower, two for core, four for cardio. Then you can start to pick what those exercises are going to be. I think I've mentioned before as well, I used to always have like a, a list. I'd have upper body exercises, lower body, core, cardio and i would just go across i'll be like pick them pick them pick them and just just sort of just sort of picking them off might be exercises that i haven't done for a while it might be exercises that i know certain members can do really well um and we'll get a lot out of so again um when it came to planning a circuit normally i wouldn't really think about it until on the day because you could go through set your stations out um how many stations do you want how many for upper how many for lower how many for your core how many do you want to be cardio you might even think okay how many do i want to be with equipment how many do i want to be without equipment um and then again you know you can start to look at okay exercises that have equipment exercises that don't um so an example of this sort of split i guess would be shoulder press and upright row for the shoulders and for the upper body squats and lunges for the for the legs for the lower body crunches and back extension for core so although i think when people think of core and i know i've gone into this i think when people think of core they think of abs the abdominals that wall that sits on the outside of your stomach that makes up the the six pack really whereas when it comes to core that's your obliques so down your side of your abs and your yeah, your lower back muscles as well so a back extension really good for that core strength um I've had clients over the years that come into a plank position, their abs can take it, their lower back can't, and they get pain in their lower back. So we want to make sure that that core is nice and strong all the way through, like a tree trunk rather than just the front face where the, where the six-pack abs are. Um, so crunches and back extension for core. Um, and then for cardio, we're doing shuttle runs, burpees, jumping jacks, and side steps, side step skaters. So four different cardio exercises there. Okay, guys, cool. So hopefully by now we're starting to get a little bit of an idea of okay, not just what do I need to what do I need to consider and what do I need to think about um in terms of space and equipment and the numbers and stuff like that, but how are you actually going to and um, what appeals to you? You know, what interests you, what what how would you like to do your circuit? How would you like your circuit to look? How would you like people to feel after your circuit as well? You know, in terms of, um, we can get into it a little bit more in time, but you think of, 
running through this circuit doing two shoulder exercises in a row and then two leg exercises in a row and then two core exercises in a row and then four cardio exercises in a row. If you're doing 30 seconds on, maybe it's 40 seconds on, 20 seconds rest, you're essentially doing four high cardio exercises in a row at the end of this circuit. If this was your first exercise, can't be for everybody. It can only be one person's first exercise. But if this was just, you know, one person doing this circuit, or if this was you turning up to do this circuit and this was the order that you did them in, you know, your shoulders are going to work quite hard at the start of it. In fact, no, let's, 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 uh, let's stick with cardio. We'll come back to shoulders in just a minute. So that is four cardio exercises in a row. So in a 10-minute circuit, 10 stations, about a minute a circuit, about a minute a station, that's four minutes of solid cardio at the end, you know. Maybe you could look to mix that in. Maybe you could put one of them there and another one there and then finish with two cardio exercises. So you're not doing all your cardio in a row. You do all your cardio in a row, it's going to be cardiovascularly harder. Yeah, and if that is the benefit that you want, you could get away with leaving them together. Again, I have done sessions where people do circuits where you do all your legs exercises consecutively and then all your upper body exercises consecutively rather than alternating. Because then the same muscle gets worked two sets in a row. It's got to work a lot harder. It's a lot tighter. If you go into, so an upright row, you get a, you get a barbell, pull it up to there. Yeah, and it works these shoulder muscles. Pull the, pull the weight up to there. You then go into a shoulder press afterwards, you're using the same muscles. So two, two exercises in a row that use, you use the same muscle is going to be really challenging. Really good for endurance, remember, when we think about those different types of fitness, those different components of fitness. Endurance comes from them working for longer. So if you want to develop endurance in a particular muscle, put those exercises closer to each other that's the way that i used to do it if i want somebody to really feel as though their legs have worked from an endurance point of view i would put five exercises for legs in a row if i wanted them to focus more on hitting each station pretty fresh you know i might do a legs exercise and then a cardio where they can keep the heart rate up a bit but the leg muscles don't work so hard then the next one back to legs then back to cardio, then back to legs. So again, it's entirely up to you the way you want to do it. You can alternate them. You can put them all together. You can mix these exercises up, or you can just say, right, two upper, two lower, two core, four cardio, and I'm going to run them exactly as that. You know, just be aware of how that's going to make somebody feel, you know, like I say, the endurance, the lactic acid. Um, and do it because you want that benefit for them, I guess. Um. Yeah, that was the, I always used to structure my circuit in, term, in terms of how do I want people to feel at the end and, and maybe it's even tomorrow. Um, okay then, guys. So all the things that we're going to be taking into consideration and that, of course, I want you to start in narrowing down and sort of trying to um, make a decision on, right, okay, this is a hypothetical class, but where would you run it? Yeah, where would you be doing this circuit? Would it be in a gym? Would it be in just a sports hall? You know, would it be one that you would do outside? And then you can start to get yourself into that headspace. Okay, what equipment would I have? Um, what what equipment and what exercises have we looked at? So again, if you want to go back and look at body weight exercises or um resistance exercises, you can go back to the last two sessions and recap on those as well maybe to get some extra inspiration. And as I mentioned at the end of last week's session as well, if you're still struggling for inspiration and for ideas, then by all means, get yourself onto the old um, Media Savvy Workout playlist because there's plenty of um, exercises on there. A lot of body weight ones, but even some without. Um, so by all means, go check them out as well. Lots and lots of them um, on the workout playlist. Um, okay, guys, cool. So now we can be looking at the um, use tool and equipment workbook. 
yeah, um, and complete task 1.3. So, um, yeah, it's using tools and equipment workbook that you want. If you haven't already got it, that's linked in the description. So just pull that down off that link. Um, so, yeah, we've got a little um, a little workbook task to do. Um, in fact, I'm going to load that up and we'll go to the workbook. Although that, that is a little um, a little picture of what it does look like. Tools and equipment. Okay, that's bear with me. Okay, so this is the workbook that we are um, looking at. So, is there a window all the way? Okay, and then so we are looking at 1.3, okay. Hello. Okay, so we should be back. We should be back. We should have volume again. I'm just going to give it a minute because the stream's a couple of seconds behind. Hello. There we go. There we go. Technology, guys. Technology. Um, right, okay. So I'm not going to risk doing that again. Um. PDF says no today. Um, right, bear with us two seconds. I'll get that PowerPoint back up, and we will. Um, we'll, on, we'll have a look at some that learners have done in the past as well. Um, no, it doesn't like the screen share. It doesn't like the screen share. Um, all right, guys, give us two seconds. Bear with us. I'll put you some nice uh, background music on if I knew how. Um, right. Okay. Get us back to PowerPoint. I'll be happy. Okay, there we go. There we go. Right. For the sake of the day, yeah. Um, you guys have got your workbooks. For some reason, um, I cannot get the PDF open on this end. So um, looking at the workbook task, I'm just going to zoom in to make it that little bit bigger. Um, I'll go just so you can get a bit of a better look at what we're looking at. Um, apologies about that, guys. Uh, technical problems. Always a Monday as well. Um, 
Okay, cool. So if you, all you're doing pretty much is you're going to start um, planning out your own circuit training um, session and how you, uh, what do you plan to use? What's the name of the uh, of the exercise or, you know, what equipment are you going to need, etc. cetera. Um, so we can actually start getting some, like I say, some actual stuff written down now. We can get some stuff um, pen to paper, so they say, um, and start to get a bit of a plan, like, what do I want mine to actually look like? So all you need to do is um, even maybe put the exercise in here. And then you can put um, the name of the exercise and the equipment and maybe a little, a little description of, you know, what that exercise is. It gives you an idea of what you're going to put for your description actually on the um, circuit card when we come to actually finish them and, and um, get them done ourselves. Um, okay, guys, cool. So, uh, so that is using tools and equipment workbook task 1.3. Yeah, so that's what we need um, for, for that task. And then, like I say, we can get our circuit actually written down. Um, and then you've just got, right, okay, these, remember, we're going for a minimum of six. So two with equipment, a minimum of two with equipment, a minimum of six overall, maximum of 10. Um, plan those stations out. What's the name of the exercise? What equipment do you need? And again, that's starting to pull information together that we can put actually on your on your circuit cards as well. Um, okay, guys, cool. So I do want to come back to um, this section here. So we'll come back to that one and we'll look at... Um, yeah, we'll come back to that in just a minute. But I just want to look at some um, examples of, of circuit cards that other learners have done in the past as well. So um, again, just to give you a little bit of an idea, or maybe it's a little bit of inspiration. Um, so this this was one example. Again, I, 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 um, I, I, I was I taught some of these classes, um, and some of them were, were were from previous ones that Mel has done as well. Um, so I really like this one. It's nice and straightforward. It's um, but at the same time, it's got obviously the key information on there as well. So we can see that um, whoever's done them has put. You know, the first thing that I see is, is is the picture. You know, gives you a little bit of a, a little bit of a description of what it should look like. Um, but then really we've got at the top name of the exercise or the name of the equipment. Um, the name of the exercise is underneath it. So we've got a kettlebell, kettlebell swing. Um, the number two as well is for um, what number in the circuit is it? So I think I mentioned before as well that can be really helpful in keeping the class flowing um, keeping people organized in the sense that if oh, on. if somebody's on circuit two and the next one they get to says like number four, they're going to be thinking, all right, I've missed one. I need to go back, figure out what I've missed um, and, and make sure that I do it rather than, you know, if you do it without numbers, somebody just moves on to what they think is the next, station and it's not really they've missed one and they get to the same one as somebody else or you get to the end of the circuit and half the class think they're done half the class think they've got one more exercise to do you know um and it can all be avoided just by having numbers on your circuit cards you know now that might be that might be something that you want to put on in pencil so you can rub it off and change the number each week kettlebells won't always be circuit two in your in your circuit in your circuit, they, they might be, and, and for, for the purposes of this unit. But in terms of planning our own, own circuit and having the cards ready in general, I used to write mine in a pencil. Um, so, again, you, you could sort of change it session to session. Um, okay, then, so what else have we got on there? What else have we got? What else can we spy? So we've got... Um, a little description, so how to do the exercise. So stand over the kettlebell with feet hip width apart. Chest up, shoulders back and down. Yeah, so you've got like chest out, shoulders back and down, standing over this kettlebell. Um, the bell should be in line with the middle of your feet, so it's directly sort of underneath you in between your feet. 
Um, get a hold of the kettlebell and then swing it upwards. Aim for chest height with arms extended. Yeah, so you are um, swinging the kettlebell upwards to about chest height and then letting it come down again. Yeah, from a side on view, thinking like sort of swinging it up and then back down again. Yeah. Um, let the kettlebell swing down and then repeat. Um, so a little little sort of couple of sentences to tell us how to do it. Maybe it's just to, to jerk the memory a little bit. If you know, at the start of the session, the instructor's probably gone around and showed you all the exercises and then you get to a particular station and, you know, you, you, you say the name and you might be thinking, oh, what was that one again? Whereas if you've got a, a couple of little descriptive sentences you can look at, then um, it might just jog your memory a little bit. Yeah, oh, okay, that one. And it might bring back other teaching and coaching points and like other other sort of techniques and ways that you could do it. Um, so, of course, bottom left, we've got the equipment that is needed, which is, of course, going to be a kettlebell. You have a hard time doing a kettlebell swing without one. Not to say that it's impossible. I've, um, again, thinking outside the box a little bit, I've been using the old, um, it's like a big bottle of, I want to say detergent or fabric conditioner. Fabric conditioner, that's the one. I always get them mixed up. Um, and it's got a handle on it, obviously, for pouring. Now, when that ran out, I just filled it up with water. Filled it up with water, put the lid back on. Obviously, water weighs a little bit as well. So then I've essentially got a kettlebell that I can use at home. And I've got the handle to get hold of it as well. So it's not impossible. But yeah, in this case, you're going to want a, a kettlebell um, when you get into the gym or um, into, into, the, into the class or whatever it is. So kettlebell. There might be a little bit of trial and error for what's the right weight. What's the right weight of kettlebell? Because, of course, that's going to change from exercise to exercise. That can change from day to day. Depending on how you're feeling, how well rested are you, how much food have you had. Um, the weight that is right for you might change from session to session and the weight is probably going to change from person to person again as well so this might be somewhere where you want to think to yourself right okay i've got 20 people that are turning up for this class chances are instead of just one kettlebell and just hoping everybody does the same weight you might need to have three or four kettlebells yeah you might need to have three or four different weights of kettlebells for people to pick from again in terms of regression and progress and, and progression Somebody comes along and it's the 20 kilogram and they can't pick it up. Well, it's, it's too hard. If someone comes along as two, two kilograms and it's too easy, then it's far too easy. And it needs, it needs uh, to be a bit more challenging. So we have got, yeah, we've got the name of the exercise. We've got the equipment. We've got the um, little, we've got a description. We've got what number in the circuit it is. We've got our little drawing. Um, and then even in the bottom right, it even tells us what muscles we're going to use there as well. So we've got um, shoulders being used, back being used, hips being used, legs and glutes all being used through that um, through that kettlebell swing movement. It's a really good exercise, actually. It's a really big movement, burns lots of calories, stimulates lots of muscle. Um, it's a it's 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 a good uh, exercise. I do like me. Um, I do like a kettlebell swing. Especially knowing how that it is doable at home without needing to go and drop 20 quid on a kettlebell as well. Get yourself a little, um, any bottle with a handle will do. Fill it with water and away you go. Yeah, little tip there, little tip. Uh, right, okay, let's move on to another one then. So um, this one follows a very um, similar sort of layout. They look like they're done by the same person. Um, so we can see that we've got... Um, same again, it's a, it's a very clear format, actually, that carries across. You can tell that these have been done from this, by the same people or by the same person. This one was station number two. This one is station number four. Yeah, so station number four. And we can see pretty clearly, once you've done one of these circuit cards, you know what you're looking for in all of them. You know, you know to look bottom left to see what equipment you need. Yeah, you know, you can look in the bottom right and see what muscles you're using. Top right for your description, top top left for your little diagram. Very, um, 
I like the fact that you could go from one station straight to a new station and know what to expect when you when you look at your circuit card. The only thing that changes is the exercise that's being done. The rest of the card stays the same, really, you know, especially in terms of layout. So again, we've got the name at the top. So we've got squats, our little description. So stand with your feet uh, hip width apart in line with your shoulders or stand with your feet wide enough apart that they're in line with your shoulders. Keep your back positioned straight so your back's nice and flat. Keep your knees centered over your feet. Slowly bend your knees, hips and ankles lower in until you reach a 90 degree angle. Uh, return to um, depend where we started but return to standing position and repeat. Yeah. Um, just sitting on the invisible chair really, isn't it? A squat. Um, so nice little straightforward description there of, of what it is or how to do it again if you got there and you know you get to a circuit all the time in front of you is a mat you'd be like what was this one again like if there's dumbbells you're going to think oh it might have been dumbbell curl I remember him showing us that or I remember her showing us that one but if it's just something like something quite ambiguous like a mat you might get there and be like was this burpees was it mountain climbers um, so again it's, it's, that's where these, these circuit cards are um, really, really helpful. So we've got our description, we've got our name, we've got our muscles used, um, the equipment that's being needed, and we've even got, again, a little, a little um, diagram, a little, a little uh, drawing of, of a guy doing a squat and showing us um, how it's done. And that is definitely... A nice flat back that he's demonstrating there on that picture. Nice flat back. Not going to hurt yourself there. Yeah, I'm all right, guys. There we go. Just juggling the old chat in the background as well. Um, okay, so yeah, that was another example by the same person. Um, and this one was as well. I'll pop this one in because um, this is the, the first one that really uses any... Um, Oh, it, it, it uses our dumbbells. Yeah, so again, we've got our dumbbells in there as well. So I like that this person's not only just written down what, what equipment they're using as well. I like the extra touch of um, drawing the equipment. So there's our kettlebell, there's our mat, and this one we've got a mat and dumbbells as well. So there might be several pieces of equipment that you're going to need, uh, and they'll, they should all be on there, really. So again, number, uh, station number three, so oh, actually, if this was number three, that was that was two, that was three, that was four, we can see that he's gone from quite a leg-heavy exercise, so hips, legs, and glutes in the kettlebell swing, to then an upper body exercise for the triceps, and then back to lower body. So this person was probably alternating upper body, lower body, upper, lower, and backwards and forwards rather than you know, if they wanted to put all the legs exercises together, they could do kettlebell swings straight into squats or vice versa. They've chosen to put a, an upper body exercise in between those two. Um, so for our um, for our dumbbell chest press. Um, so our dumbbell chest press. So again, we know what equipment we're using. We know what muscles it's trying to work just in the name of the exercise. But it's also at the bottom just in terms of a little bit of clarity as well. Um, you could probably argue that pecs are going to get used in this exercise as well. So we're laid down on your back, holding two dumbbells at chest level along your body, palms facing your feet. Yeah, so palms are facing away from you rather than inwards. So palms facing your feet. Raise dumbbells straight up until elbows are close to being locked and lower them back shortly after a short pause. Breathe out when raising the dumbbells and breathe in when lowering them back down. Yeah. So same again, little description that we can follow there, um, knowing that we're using our, um, of course, it says chest at the top, but we're using those triceps as well. And again, little equipment needed, not just the names, but also a little uh, a little diagram, which I really like. You know, I hadn't really thought about that so much, but I, I, that's a nice touch in the sense that, um, you know, not everybody knows what a barbell looks like or a kettlebell looks like. You know, you might get there and you might get barbells and dumbbells mixed up. That's, you know, depending on the exercise, that could be 
quite quite a drastic thing to get mixed up. So it is handy to know which like which of the equipment that you're actually looking for. Um, that's for sure. Um, okay then, guys, cool. Okay, so give it a little bit of um, a little bit of variety. This this is um obviously a style that was done by somebody different. I mean, you can see these first three. I think you can tell they're very very standard. Everything stays the same. Loud stays the same. It's easy to see that those are done by the same person. Um, but then this this is a bit of a different, a little bit of a different approach. So we've got um, exercise number one, which is which is outlaid in the top left. Yeah. So possibly the first thing that you're going to see, given that we naturally lead, lead, read top to bottom, left to right. Top left tends to be the one of the first places that we look. So. Nice and straightforward number in the top, nice and clear um, exercise name, and then maybe just in brackets underneath, maybe he's mentioning the equipment that you're using or, or whatever, because some some exercises you can do with equipment or without. Russian twists you can lean back and do without exercise or uh, without without equipment. Sorry, or you can get a medicine ball or something and do it with um with equipment. So again, you've got to specify which of the two are you are you looking for. That could be your regression or your progression as well. You, you say Russian twist with a medicine ball. If somebody says, excuse me, this is a little bit hard, take the medicine ball off them, just regular Russian twists. Somebody says it's too easy. Well, that's where you need to think outside the box a little bit. And it might, it might even just be just give them a heavier medicine ball, you know? It might also be other things like get them to lift their feet off the floor instead of having them touch it. Um, right, so again, we can see um, the muscles used is at the top of this one. So we can see what muscles are being used, um, abdominals and obliques. Um, little description, so lie on the floor, keeping your feet flat or under something. Elevate your upper body to create a V-shape with your thighs, so your thighs, and then your upper body's there. Hold the medicine ball in both hands, twisting from side to side um, until arms are parallel with the floor in front of your body. Yeah, so you're twisting from side to side and you're going to get those abdominals and those obliques working as well. And same again, equipment needed. Um, we've got a mat and medicine ball. Yeah, so a little bit of a stylistic choices here, I guess. This person obviously chose to draw the equipment. Yeah, and go a little bit further and just uh, like I say, a really nice touch drawing the equipment. These have got and 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 gone to even put um some of the health and safety stuff on the card itself. So things like checking your medicine ball for tears, rips, make sure the handles are intact. Um, same with the mat as well. You know, so not only what equipment do you need, but you know, making sure with it or how to make sure that it's safe to use before you actually use it. A lot of the time, you might have. You're going to have some kind of rest time in your circuit. You know, um, even if it's 10, 20 seconds, you might work for 40, have 20 seconds rest, and then move on. In those 20 seconds, you might be able to um, use those 20 seconds to read that and do those little checks. Check your medicine ball for tears, rips, do the same with your mat. When the timer goes, you've done both of them and you're ready to go for your next set and get most out of it again. Yeah? So... These cards didn't have the, the diagrams of the uh, the drawings of the equipment. Um, and this uh, this person chose to do that, but but also opted to leave off the, the health and safety little sort of bullet point at the bottom, I guess you could say. Um, so again, just something to think about. Do you maybe just want to include both of those? The more information that's on there is going to be the better. Um, but still, these were these were really good cards, regardless, you know. Um, right, where are we? Okay, so then we've got uh, we've got another one um, called a cone sprint. So some exercises, and certainly different instructors, are going to call a different exercises different things. Yeah. Um, you might call this a cone sprint. Somebody else might call it like a shuttle run. Other people might call it a slalom or a gauntlet or something. 
Um, you know, it's 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 gonna change from person to person, probably. Uh, but as long as you know what you mean, and you know that as people keep coming to your class, um, they'll get used to what you call things as well. Um, so don't worry too much about that. Um, if you're not hundred percent sure on what an exercise would be called, if it's running from cone to cone. You know, you've got a little bit of flexibility, a little bit of freedom there. Um, so we can see actually that this one was was exercise 10. So this person finished with a cardio exercise, which I kind of do like to do because if you let people know it's their last one, they'll normally push really hard through it as well. Um, so a cone sprint. Again, we've got our equipment needed. We've got our diagram. Um, so sprint through the cones, running around each one as closely and as quickly as possible. Also bend down and touch each one before moving on to the next one until the last cone uh, and repeat going back to the first cone. So all the way out and turn on come all the way back in. Um, muscles used. Um, it's, it's, so it's a cardiovascular workout. You are using your calves a little bit as well so you're using your, your heart and lungs as much as anything um, and, and your calves to a little extent and then the equipment needed at the bottom again we've got our cones drawn on there so those are just a couple of different styles or a couple of just different examples that we've had from learners in the past um, and again it might start to give you a little bit of an idea or a little bit of inspiration for, for how you want yours to look as well um, okay then guys okay well Oh, we do make sure the old live stream still there, still there, still working. Yeah, nice one. Um, okay, guys, cool. So, just want to have a little whip back through and look at. I know we've looked at exercises we can do with fitness equipment, but we haven't really stopped to look and think about um the health and safety sort of requirements for each bit of kit. Um, which again, especially if you're going to put them on your cards, which I do recommend. Um. We're going to need to know. Even if you don't put them on your cards, if you turn up to a fitness class or if you ever teach in a fitness class, the, obviously even more so, um, you need to make sure that your clients or your members or if it's just you going to a class, you need to make sure that you're not going to be getting hurt. You know, um, I've been obviously the instructor before who's who needs to check all the equipment beforehand but then i've also had clients that have come along done a couple of medicine ball slams and the medicine ball is split and they've known to say rob sorry this is this is split rather than just keep going you know they knew that it being split means that the sand might drop they might have it above their head they might look up at the wrong time get sand in your eyes and you've got a 20 kilogram medicine ball above your head or whatever it is so it's handy if if the members know what they're looking out for as well you might, as an instructor, be quite confident that you've checked everything. It's easy to miss something or for something to break once it starts getting used as well. Yeah, so um, that, that's just another reason why it helps to have that information on our circuit cards. Um, okay, then. So let's go through some of the equipment that we've looked at. Because when it comes to body weight exercises, there's not much. In terms of health and safety, I mean, other than technique and making sure that we're doing it right, making sure that we've got the space around us if we're doing burpees or running or shuttles. Body weight, it tends to be making sure you've got the space um, to do something. Whereas, of course, with equipment, the equipment itself can go, um, can start to break and get damaged and stuff. So when we're doing exercises with equipment, we just need that extra step to make sure that we're prepared and ultimately safe. Okay, guys, cool. So resistance bands. Resistance bands is definitely one that we've mentioned before. Um, I may have even mentioned this myself because this this has happened to me. Um, you go to, it's, it's a big elastic band, a resistance band, which is great. You know, you get the you get the resistance. I've done pretty much most I've done most of my training through lockdown with a resistance band. As I mentioned earlier on, they're cheap. They don't take up much space and they are really versatile. So you can work your legs, you can work your arms, you can work your core. Um, so really, really good bits of kit. Now, as they've had a lot of hammer over the last two years, um, 
they start to perish. They're rubber at the end of the day. Rubber, you know, it will wear and tear. Um, and with a, an elastic band, you know, if you put tension on that band and it's begin it's beginning to rip, um, the whole thing could 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 snap and come apart. Um, again, like I say, I have had it happen to me. Um, luckily, you know, I picked up this band, gave it a once over, and saw there was a little tear in it. And I thought, you know what, I'll still use it, but I'm not going to use it anywhere near my face. You know, so I had it, um, I was doing like um, a different exercise, but it was down by my feet anyway. And when it snapped, yeah, it snapped. I wasn't overly surprised, but it was well away from my eyes and my face and stuff like that. If I'd have had it up here doing a pull apart or something like that, and it had snapped straight in my face, you know, you could lose lose an eye or something. So before we use it, make sure that we're checking for any small rips in the bands or maybe even rips or um, tears in the handles or broken handles, because some of them you'll get, it's like, a, it's like, a, it's like a, a band, but it's a tube. And on the end, there's like two clips and you can put handles on them and do different stuff with them. Um, of course, just make sure that the handles can't like nip your skin or rip anything or tear anything as well. Um, but yeah, with resistance bands, I find it's more to do with the, the elasticity of the band itself, especially when it starts to um, tear and stuff like that. Um, in terms of like other safety points, making sure that they're out of the way when you're done with them as well, you know, especially because some of them, like you might have a resistance band like this, which is just like a long strip, whereas some of them make a make an actual loop. Yeah, so some of them make an actual loop, which, um, you know, is helpful for different exercises and stuff, but it's easy to get your foot caught in them, trip, um, especially if you're, already doing another exercise maybe you're doing walking lunges maybe you you know doing shuttle runs up and down the gym or something you don't want to be tripping over a resistance band and um, so check for any small rips in the bands um make sure that they're stored properly when they're not being used either hang up or in a storage box normally at the very least on a little shelf or something um and again, I guess kind of in terms of safety and also in terms of regression and progression, different colours usually mean different um, level of resistance. So I'm trying to think of mine off the top of my head. The green one is the easiest to pull. So it's the stretchiest. Then there's blue, then there's purple, then there's black. Black being the hardest. It takes a lot of effort to, to move it at all. So again, if someone's finding something too easy, give them a harder colour. Someone's finding something too... Um, hard gives them a bit of an easier colour as well could be a way to just make those little um, sort of on the spot adjustments really um, but yeah resistance bands want to make sure that they're intact and, and not torn or anything before we start using them and making sure that we've got the right resistance as well not just in terms of progression and regression but health and safety making sure that we're, we're working with good technique you know, if you're trying to do like a pull and the resistance band's too hard, you might find yourself leaning back over and trying to put extra strain into it. And, you know, you're not working the muscles that you're trying to work, but you maybe even putting the wrong sort of strain and tension on the other parts of your body as well. Um, so I want to make sure that we've got good form. It's the same as if you went to do a squat. If the weight was too heavy, you're going to potentially hurt yourself and you're not going to be able to work to the best of your ability. It's the same with the resistance band want to try and make sure that we're working right in that sort of zone where it's not too hard and not too easy. Um, in terms of finding that, actually, just before we do move on, in terms of finding that, I like to use what we call the RPE scale. So it's essentially, I'll say to a client, or I will myself, if I'm doing this for myself, I use this like a 0 to 10 scale. So zero is if I'm sat at home, on the couch like I am now. I'm at zero on the exercise scale right now. Um, and 10 being working so hard that I'm about to pass out. Really, through a workout, the majority of the time, you're probably going to want to be close to seven, eight. At a push, nine. Every now and then a 10. But if somebody looks that they're working under... A six. You know, that's where I would be saying, look, we need to make this a little bit harder for you. They might not say, look, I need it to be harder, but you might say to them, on a scale of not to 10, how hard are you working? And they might go six. You're right, right, okay. 
let's, let's up that intensity for you as well. So that's that's my little method that I've always used, the RPE scale, and that is the, the rate of perceived exertion, how tired do they think they are. Um, if somebody says 10, you know, maybe you might want to make it a little bit, you might want to just knock it back a little bit for them. You know, there's times where we do want to work at 10, but it's, it's, not, it's not all the time. And probably a bit less often than you might think, actually. Um, I think that, that's... People think we need to work at 10 the whole time we're exercising. I think that's what puts a lot of people off, truth be told, but we don't, even being at a 7 or an 8. But yeah, try that. Try that in the future. Try that for yourself. Um, when you are exercising, how hard are you exercising? Are you at a four, five, six? Can you maybe go that little bit harder? Or are you all already at a nine or a ten? Do you maybe need to knock it back a little bit? Stuff to think about, guys. Stuff to think about. Um, okay, so that is um that's resistance bands. Pretty much done. Those are those are the big things, making sure that they're aware. Get your get your resistance right and just make sure they're not ripped before you start using them, really. Um, okay, then, so what about steps? What about steps, then? Um, like we mentioned, really good for cardiovascular exercises, stepping onto, stepping off of, you know, maybe it's even jumps, stuff like that. You might get down, you might do some press-ups with your, either your feet or your hands on the step. Um, so what do we want to watch out for with these? Because these aren't going to snap like a resistance band, are they? Oh, I've got the dog coming to see us. Good boy. Come lay down. Good boy. So one of the first things that we might be wanting to look for is um is is that there's no cracks in the plastic. Um like I say, the resistance band will snap. Look, guys, at the end of the day, plastic can snap as well. Um, I've never seen one of these snap, touch wood. But you know, at the end of the day, if there's cracks that we haven't noticed and Plastic gets a lot of wear and tear over time. It may well start to um, start the crack. So just just making sure that it's sort of structurally sound before you start using it and putting your weight on it, I guess. Um, another thing that you might want to check for is, of course, that the surface rubber is attached. So we can see that this rubber here is designed to give us a little bit of extra grip, either for stepping onto, jumping onto, or whatever. Um. Um, so yeah, we want to make sure that that's attached. If we jump onto that and it's not attached, you know, it might, it might, it might slide out from underneath you. Like it, you may as well be jumping onto something with a tablecloth on. If it's not attached, you could just go straight out from underneath you. You can lose your feet and you're going to go back over. Um, or you could even, you know, it might not be that the rubber's loose entirely, but it might be this little bit along here is loose. So you go to step up or jump up when your foot gets caught. Um, now, again, this is one of the exercises that you might be doing something while carrying something else. You might be stepping on and off to the step. You know, you might be on and off of the step, um, but you've got a, a medicine ball in your chest or a kettlebell, a kettlebell held to your chest. If you trip or fall, you know, and your hands are preoccupied, you know, you've got, you've got nothing to stop yourself with on the way down. Um, not to mention the weight could then land on you and cause you extra harm. Um, so like I say, you want to make sure that the rubber is nice and secure as well. Make sure it's not going to slip off or you're not going to get your feet caught on it or anything like that. Come to say hi. Come to say hi to the guys, have you? Sulking because he's in his cool. Um, okay, so next thing that you're going to want to think about as well is going to be the um, is the feet. As we've mentioned, when we've looked at different fitness kit and stuff like that, we can see that um, we can put these almost like like little, little, you can call them feet, you could call them pillows, whatever you want to call them. You can put them underneath like each end of the step to raise the step and make it that little bit higher. Um, and obviously just, just make it more of a range to move through, make Get a bit more challenging. Um, so we want to make sure that the feet are actually attached properly as well. It doesn't come for very much if we've checked that the rubber's attached, it's, there's no cracks. If as soon as we go to stand on it, the feet come out from underneath it, and again, we end up going back over, end up falling as well. Um, so we want to make sure that the feet are, you know, nice and, nice and snug, 
Um, you you could even say that you know you want to make sure that the step isn't too high, depending on what the exercise is going to be. If you're going to do box jumps up on one of these steps, you want to make sure it's not too high. You know, otherwise you'll you'll not quite make it. You're jumping up with both feet. You may be smashing knees off the side of the uh, or your shins off the side of the step. I've seen it done. Um. So yeah, just making sure that everything's nice and nice and snug, nice and tight, not going to fall apart as soon as you put any body weight on it. Um, and again, making sure that we've got good form and we're not overexerting ourselves too much. Like I say, um, making sure that the step isn't too high for what it is that we're trying to do. Um, another thing is make sure that the feet are even, actually. I have seen this done where you'll have like two under one side and one under the other. And without realizing it, you you're getting onto something that's slanted, you know, which isn't um, which isn't ideal. Again, if you're carrying extra weights, got some weights on your shoulders, or you're carrying something like I say, so make sure that the feet are even and and like I say, snug and fitted correctly as well. And then you're gonna to want to check the surface area that the steps actually placed on as well. So make sure it's on a good solid surface. You know, it might be, you know, there's no cracks, the rubber's attached, the feet are on. But um, again, if it's on a, if it's on a in suit, if it's um, not on a suitable surface, you're still going to end up having problems. You know, if it's an extra slippy floor, it doesn't matter how secure the feet are or how secure, how secure the rubber is. You might still jump on it and step on it and it might skid out across the room or try and skid out from underneath you. Yeah. So, um, making sure that, yeah, that although the step is secure, we want to make sure it's on a suitable surface as well. Um, and then the last thing, again, kind of relating to making sure that they are put away properly afterwards as well. Um, I want to be, um, they're normally stacked on top of each other. You normally find that the steps stack on top of each other and so do the feet. So you might have one pile, maybe two piles of feet and then one, pile of just the just the steps as well um again i guess in terms of health and safety make sure that you don't stack them up too high there's no harm in having two piles instead of just just one giant one that's ready to fall over at any time um but yeah making sure that they get put away properly afterwards as well um and aren't in somebody else's way especially if you're just changing the steps or changing the feet really quickly I've, I have found that, like, you'll be like, oh, I'm, I've got 30 seconds to work, but I need to change this, take out one of the feet, you know, and then they just get chucked. And then they, that person gets back on with their exercise as quick as they can, but now there's two potential trip hazards elsewhere in the gym because they've just been taken off so quickly and the person's just cropped on again. Yeah, so making sure when we're not using them, they are out the way um, and not putting ourselves or other people at risk as well. Yeah. Okay then. So by all means, guys, as always, let me know if you think of anything that I've maybe overlooked, maybe experiences that you've had or that you know from other people that, that they've had. Um, make sure that we're really, really nailing down on as much of the health and safety with this kit as we as we can to make sure that we're safe and other people around us are safe as well. Um, okay, so that is uh, step done. Dumbbells then, so dumbbells. Um, and just, we may as well say that you, you're going to get two different types of dumbbells. You will have this type where they are whatever weight they are and you're not going to change that. Yeah, You can't take off these bits at the end and replace them with something else. These dumbbells are two kilograms each. Yeah, Then you'll get other dumbbells where you can screw these end bits off or the plates off the end, and you just get the handle in the middle, really, and you put however many weights on each side as you want. Yeah? So there might be some where you do change the weight and some where you don't. The ones where you don't, you've got a little bit less to worry about. Um, the ones that you do need to, that you do change the weights, and you'll probably fasten them on there with, like, a collar and stuff like that. Again, it's just easy to sort of nip something in there. So if you were just, you know, you've got the handle, you put a five kilogram plate on one end, five kilogram plate on the other, 
you don't want those weights to fall off, obviously. So you screw them up with like a little cap and make sure that they can't slide. Just again, it's moving pieces. It's easy to get like a bit of skin nipped or something like that. Um, just in terms of setting the equipment up, these dumbbells, not so much. There's nowhere really for you to nip yourself. They've normally got like just one layer of plastic over um, that, that covers the whole thing, you know. Um, you're not going to nip yourself on one of these. Um, what you might want to check for is wear and tear. So you might want to have a look and see, you know, um, is part of the handle cracked? Um, the, like I say, you don't want it to sort of shred your hands as you're trying to use your weights. Um, that's probably the biggest one with these dumbbells that we're looking at right now. Um, if the plastic starts to uh, crack or because the weight is the same all the time, it doesn't change. Some of them actually get filled with sand and can leak. So again, if there was a little crack and they were filled with sand, it might be a case of, again, similar to the medicine ball. If you push them up ahead, you know, you maybe look up just to check your form. You get sand in your eyes because it's fallen out the dumbbells. Next thing you know, you've got however many kilograms above your head and you, uh, your eyesight's impaired. You know, um, and you can you can end up hurting yourself that way as well. And just trying to just trying to put them down. Um, so yeah, watching out for sand and just watching out for any that are leaking, especially these. Like I say, um, if it's the ones where you're putting the weight on yourself again, um, I would say just make sure that they are screwed on properly so there's no bits can fall off. Again, like I've seen them done where there's no clips on. Weight gets to there, you tilt the one side a little bit, all the weights on this side slide off, and then the rest of the weight pull you over to that way. Um, yeah, I want to make sure that if we have got the, um, if we've got weights, if we're using weights, they want to be secure, but certainly if we've got anything above head height, I want to make sure that we're really using those clips and everything is nice and snug. Um, another thing to watch out for with dumbbells, um, shouldn't have to say it, but just watch out for them dropping and rolling. People will drop them when they're done with them. Um, and they can not just fall onto your foot, but they might also be a little bit more rounded than this and they might roll a bit better. Someone might put them down, they might roll off. And again, they might be in somebody's way or not so much with dumbbells because they tend to not be heavy enough. More so with barbells, but if a a weight rolls into your shin or your ankle or your leg, it can it can actually cause cause a lot of damage. Um so yeah, making sure that they're not um getting chucked when you finish with them, put them down, make sure they're not rolling off. Um and certainly when you're done with them overall, put them back. Um it, it was always one of my pet peeves in the gym, trying to get people to put their dumbbells back when they were finished with them. You know, they've got They've been and got the twos and the fours and the sixes and the eights. So they've got eight eight dumbbells there. And as soon as they're done, they just walk up and wander off, you know. And it, that, that's not just a, a health and safety thing. That's just not not respecting the other gym members as well. Someone else is going to need them. Why should they have to scour the whole gym to find them when you didn't have to? You know, when you look for them, they were where they should be, you know. Um, so make sure that they go back afterwards as well. Not just health and safety, but just for the convenience of other gym users as well. Um, sometimes it might be in a weight rack. Sometimes it might be just in a in a strong box, depending on how heavy the weights are. Um, so again, I guess you could even say, you know, if you've got them all stored in one box and you're going to try and move them, don't just try and lift the box and assume that just because, like, the twos by themselves are quite light. You might have 20 of them in there, you know. Um, and all of a sudden, you've got a lot more weight to think about as well. So, yeah, just make sure that they're not rolling off anywhere that they shouldn't. They're not getting dropped anywhere that they shouldn't. Um, and just check them for wear and tear before we use them as well. And as always, make sure that everything goes back when we're done with it. Um, okay, so moving on, moving on, moving on. Skipping ropes. Skipping ropes is a um, 
really good form of cardio. And I think we'd mentioned the other week, it's so good for getting your heart rate up, keeping it up. They use it in a lot of boxing and um, a lot of combat sports. It's good for conditioning as well. Get your heart rate and your lungs used to working at that higher level as well. Um, and again, I used to use skipping quite a lot in my um, in circuits because it is such a good um, CV exercise, cardiovascular exercise. So you want to make sure um, you want to check for any frayed ropes. Same as our resistance band, we want to make sure that the rope's not ready to snap or perish or, you know, potentially whip off when we've got a bit of tension on it and potentially lash out and hit something or somebody. And um, so just, just again, check it over, check, check the handles over, make sure that the handles are attached and that the rope's not going to come off and go flying, but also make sure that the handle looks nice and comfy to get a hold of. And it's not going to, again, shred your hand to pieces. Um, when, when we're done with them, we're normally going to um, wrap them up and tie them in a loose knot. Um, and either hang them on a peg or store them on a box. Maybe again on a shelf. I've seen used just just to get them away. But certainly not on the floor. Certainly not loose. Um, for everybody to trip over again. Um. So th th those might be teaching points that you might want to put on your um or health and safety points you might want to put on your cards. So um, when we're looking at the cards, we're thinking mainly about the health and safety of the person doing the exercise. Um, just in just for the argument, like for the sake of the day's discussion, though, we may as well think about the, the health and safety um, of others around us as well. So when we're using the skipping rope again, check what space we've got. Make sure that this bit of plastic that's flying around our bodies really, really quick isn't going to catch something or somebody else on the way um, gets snagged on somebody else's kit or catch somebody across a bare bit of skin or something because that's going to hurt those skipping ropes don't half uh, whip through the air so checking our space um, and yeah making sure that when we're done with them not using them they are away either tied up hung up put in a box um, and just away from the area so that they're not a trip hazard um, and then like I say just the unit itself check the rope check the handles uh, and then we're, we should be pretty much good to go. Um, okay, medicine balls next then. Medicine balls. So, um, first of all, medicine balls are going to be very much like the um, preloaded dumbbells. They've got to get the weight from somewhere. It tends to be um, sand or sometimes like a gel, sometimes like a liquid. Um and again, if the ball splits, that can start to seep out. So, again, I think this this was this was the the one that this was one of the bits of kit I was using when I very first saw this happen. Actually, um, I was getting a client to do. They were actually laid on their back, doing like a press with a medicine ball, like a ball that had handles on. Like this one under here, so that's a medicine ball, but with we can see one of the handles on the side. Um, and she did like she did one push, and then she was like, she she got something in her eyes, and I was looking at the ceiling, like what on earth come down from the ceiling? But she pushed this medicine ball up, and it did. It had like um, it had a split in it, so it was bits of um, it wasn't sand. I don't know exactly what it was, but. It was falling down onto her face in the middle of this set while well, she's got like weight above her head. Um, so obviously that medicine ball got, got retired there and then. But it, it, it does happen. And we, you normally don't realize that it's there until it's too late. But that's why we need to make a point of checking stuff before we use it. Um, so make sure that there's no rips because these medicine balls do get a lot of wear and tear. They might be thrown onto the floor. They might be thrown against the wall. Um you know, they take quite a lot of impact, some of them. Um, so they might begin to split and perish. So, yeah, always check them. Make sure that there's no leaks and nothing coming out. Because, um, again, even it might not fall on you. Sand on a wooden laminated flooring is slippy. It's really slippy, so it becomes really easy to um, do yourself some damage. Um, and you might not even see it because of, the, obviously, the colour. 
you might not see it. And next thing you know, you look at the ceiling. Or you've gone down into some form of accidental splits. Um, so in terms of the ones that do have handles, check the handles for damage as well. Make sure the handle's not going to drop off and you can get a good secure uh, grip on it. Again, depends on what you're going to do. I've seen people do like kettlebell swing style movements with the medicine ball. So again, you swing the ball up to shoulder height and then back down. If the handle is loose, the G-force from it swinging might be enough to snap the handle off. And next thing you know, you've got a medicine ball that's nine kilograms sailing away from you across the gym and there's nothing you can do. You know, if that's going towards somebody, chances of you even being able to get their attention and get them out of the way in time is pretty slim. So check the handles, especially before we start doing swings and throws and stuff like that. That's for sure. Um, check that the surface area that you're planning on using is suitable for the ball to be thrown off, if that is what you're planning on doing. I've seen... You know, I've seen concrete floors used and knack of a ball up easier. I've seen certain wooden flooring used where the medicine balls smashed it or cracked it. Um, I've seen, obviously, um, certain exercises you can do involve throwing a medicine ball against a wall. But that doesn't mean that every wall is up to the task. I've seen it tried with plasterboard and just crack it and put a hole in it. Um, whereas if you've got brick or whatever, then, then yeah, you probably can get away with it. Um, but just checking that whatever you plan on doing with the ball on whatever surface, just double check that it's suitable first because you can either wreck the ball, you can wreck the floor, you can do both, or you can potentially um, cause yourself or somebody else a little bit of harm as well. And probably cost some people some money as well along the way. Um, so yeah, just checking that the surface area is suitable for the ball before before whatever it is that you do. And then again, um, when we're storing them, make sure they're away, normally on a rack like they are here. That means that they can't roll off, get in other people's way, get, in, get un, under other people's feet. Or sometimes it might just be a, a heavy duty storage container. Now some medicine balls are designed to bounce when they hit the floor. Yeah, they tend to be the the rounder ones. No, stick with me because all medicine balls should be round. Um, they tend to be the rounder ones. Now, they they will want to roll off if you leave them alone. Probably, um, it's a ball. But some of them are designed not to bounce back up when you chuck them at the floor. You hit, hit, hit it off the floor and it bounces back up. All you've got to do is catch it. If it doesn't bounce, you've got to squat down to pick it up. So you're actually working harder. Now, those medicine balls don't roll so much because when they hit the floor, they take the shape of the floor a little bit. The bottom of them flattens out, which stops them bouncing back up. So some you can sort of just leave out and they won't roll. Some will. Some obviously need to be put away. Um, and I don't know if this is an official thing or whether this is just the way that I've always thought about it. Always put the lighter weights at the top. So if you've got a rack, whether it's dumbbells, whether it's medicine balls, have the one at the top, then the two, then the three. Don't have the heaviest at the top ready to fall off and hit somebody. Yeah, it's the way that I used to do it. Um, have the heavy one at the bottom where you've just got to roll it off rather than, um, yeah, having the higher one at the, at, at, at the top. Um, lighter ones at the top, heavy ones at the bottom because if they fall... They've uh, got less distance to go and less chance of hurting somebody. Um, so medicine balls, really good form of, well, again, they're, they're a really versatile piece of kit. You can do a lot with them. Um, but want to make sure that we're um, checking all of these little sort of points before we, before we start using it and bouncing it and slamming it or whatever we're going to be doing. Okay then, guys. Okay, so moving on. Next, we have got a um, we've got a trampoline. So a trampoline is a little bit more. Um, maybe it's a little bit more outside the box. Maybe it's a little bit more out there. Um, maybe you've used one before. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you sat there thinking, "Oh, I've never used a trampoline since I was a kid." Um, but some classes will use them. Some classes will have them in as a 
part of a circuit. We did once or twice um, because we just had a trampoline in the gym. Um, But there are other exercise classes where all you use is a trampoline, thinking like boogie bounce and stuff like that. So um, it might be something that you come across. And, of course, it's handy to know what to do to make sure we're staying safe. Um, So... We want to check the, um, and some of this might take you right back to your childhood anyway, if you used to have one, um, checking that the outer, out, uh, the outer cover covers the springs. Nobody wants to land on the springs on a trampoline. It's not a good time. Um, not just landing on the springs, of course, if they're not covered, you can fall and part of you can go between the springs and the rest of you go somewhere else. It's really easy to break a leg or an arm or something that way. So make sure that the cover covers the springs. It's going to have a little bit of padding in case you do land there. Ultimately, it stops you part of you falling through them while you have usually very little control over where the rest of you goes, um, especially while we're um, airborne and bouncing and stuff like that. So make sure that the cover covers all the springs. Make sure that the legs are locked in to the unit itself because a lot of the time these legs will come out um, or fold inwards to... um, help with storage and just to take up less space. Um, so you want to check that all the legs are locked in. Um, make sure all the rubber feet are on the legs as well to make sure that we've got that extra little bit of grip. Again, you might want to argue that you, you're probably going to want to check the surface that the trampoline's going on. You know, don't make it somewhere dead slippy. If you go, if you go up in the air, you want to make sure the trampoline's still underneath you when you come back down and not skid it off six inches in a different direction. Um, and of course, trampolines, check there are no rips in the fabric as well. Um, I'm sure we've all seen at some point or other a YouTube video where somebody lands on a trampoline and it splits and they go straight through the middle. You know, something like a, a You've Been Frame Special or something like that. But, you know, it, it, it does happen. Um, and, and, and again, it can, it, can, it can cause injuries as well. So make sure that there's no rips before you start using it. Um, you know, I used to teach a trampoline class. And I think the biggest issue we used to have was springs popping or snapping in a class. Um, but yeah, make sure that the springs are covered over, loads of padding, um, legs are locked in, rubber feet on the legs, uh, on the feet, sorry, and then make sure that there's no rips as well. Um, as always, making sure that we're storing them away, you know, they're taking up as little place, space as possible. Um, not to fall over, not making a giant stack that can fall onto somebody. So to store them, legs are normally folded and the trampolines are stacked one on top of uh, the other. Yeah, so you can actually get quite a few of these into a small space, um, probably more than more than you'd think as well. Uh, right, so that was the old trampolines. Good bit of kit, actually. Um a lot of the stuff that you can do on the floor, you know, you do um, on a trampoline and they automatically become harder because the floor's trying to move underneath you. Um, so, yeah, um, good, good bit of kit in terms of working somebody, especially balance, especially balance. Get on a trampoline and stand with one leg um, and see how long you can, you can hold that for. Harder than you'd think. Um, okay, moving on then. Moving on, we're looking at a, a barbell. So a barbell is the kind of uh, the the big brother of the of the where was it the dumbbell. So dumbbell, one in each hand, weight on each end. Sometimes preloaded, like those ones were. And then you have a barbell, which is um, it's going to be big enough for you to grab with both hands, pretty much. Um, and that's normally what you're going to do with whatever exercise you're doing. You tend to grab a barbell with two hands. Um, so check that the weights are suitable for the bar. Um, again, we can see that we've got a little clip on here on the end to hold this weight in place. If we took this clip off, we could slide the weights off and change the weight as well if we wanted to. So as always, make sure that the exercise we're doing is with good form. You want to make sure that the um, clamps are on there nice and tight, as it says. Um, make sure that the clamps are secure and tight against the plates on each end of the barbell. 
but also make sure that your the load is right for whatever it is that you're about to do. Again, think about good form. You don't want to be too heavy to the point where your posture goes, your technique goes, and you're putting yourself at risk. Um, so yeah, make sure the bar's not too heavy. Make sure that the clamps are secure and nice and tight against the plates. Um, again, check that the weights are equal on each end because I've seen that done. You've got a 20 on each end, uh, on 20 this end, and only 15 kilograms on the other end. Um, which again can throw you off balance a little bit. Now, there's times where you might do that. You know, there might be times, few and far between, where you might want to make the bar unevenly balanced. But the majority of the time, um, you're going to want it to be, you know, same weight either end of the bar, and especially in the names of safety, um, make sure that they're equal. And if you are going to make it imbalanced, just by a small amount, it doesn't have to be huge. Um. But yeah, make sure that the weights are equal on each end, same as we did with um, some of the other stuff. Um, and then same again when we're storing them. Barbells can be a bit of a pain in the backside to store because obviously you take up a lot of space. Um, you lie them down, they're, they're round. They, they, they like to try and roll somewhere. Um, but you can get a you can get like a stand um, where you can stand them upright and slot them in just like a little hole. Um and you might get nine in like, you know, a, a floor space no bigger than your laptop. You get nine of these barbells slotted upright. Um, so you can either store them on a stand and um, then put the plates on a weight rack um, at a push on the floor, as long as they're stacked and neat and tidy. But ultimately, I would always say, preferably get them on a, on a weight rack if possible um, and where possible. Um, okay then, okay. Same again, it just reduces the chance of the people slipping over them and, and, and harming themselves that way. Um, so again, barbells, when we're done with them, make sure that we don't slam them down, chuck them, they will roll. Again, like, this is what I was on about earlier on. I've seen, I've seen people put the barbell down, not look at it, it's rolled off, rolled into somebody else's leg and, and, and sprained an ankle or... or Potentially, even even cracked a bone, tibia or fibia. We've got some fragile bones down in the um, the lower half of our leg. Um, if a barbell rolls into it, sitting at the right height because it's propped off the floor with enough weight on it, it can break a leg definitely. Um, so making sure that again we're not allowing our barbell to just roll off and we're not chucking it to the floor when we're done with it. Because I've seen that done as well. People, they'll do their lunges, barbells on the back, and then just boom, they'll drop it off the back. And I've seen I've seen barbells snapped in half from doing that, um, just just from dropping them on the floor. Um, can damage the floor, can damage the weights, and that's assuming it doesn't hit anybody else on the way down. So just make sure we're being uh, uh, as cautious as possible with with these weights. Uh, right, okay, we're getting there then, we're getting there, we've got a few more to do. So next one we're going to look at, we have got a an exercise mat. So one that we saw drawn on our um, examples earlier on, we saw a couple of exercises that used an exercise mat. Uh, and of course we mentioned a couple last week, although we were just looking at bodyweight exercises, you know, things like push-ups, planks, mountain climbers, you might want an exercise mat just to take a bit of pressure off the wrists or your knees. Uh, and to make it a little bit comfier on your um, sort of chest or if you're laying on your back, like your back or your bum or whatever. Um, so the two big things really with an exercise mat, you want to make sure that the, the surface area that you put them on is suitable. Again, you know, you want grip from standing on your mat. You're not going to get much grip if your mat slides all over the surface that you put it on. And again, check in for rips as well. Check for rips, check for tears. Um, again, it, it, you know, it might be something that you catch yourself on and hurt your hand. Um, mainly that's, 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 that's probably the biggest one, but again, you might have little bits of fabric, you know, just, 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 just lifted or something like that. You know, it might be just, just enough for you to get your foot or your toes caught under while you're walking past or walking up to your mat. So make sure that there's nothing, um, Obviously, be aware that the mat itself is something that you could trip on. 
and then just make sure that it's not in any kind of worn down condition that's going to make it more likely. And then when you're done, again, uh, store it, roll it up and store it in a box. Yeah. Um, some of them even have like big, almost like elastic bands that go around them that stop them unrolling again. Um, but it is handy to have them in one, one place and over to one side, out the way. And again, nobody's going nobody's gonna to trip on them that way. Uh, right, right, right. Right, bear with us. Okay, then. So, um, moving on then. Battle ropes. So, battle ropes, not quite as common, you know. Maybe it's the last few years. Maybe it's the last five years or so. I've seen them a lot more in gyms. Um, but not as common as. You know, your barbells, your dumbbells, your skipping ropes, um, your cones, your, your exercise mats. So a battle rope, you know, you might get to a circuit and they say, right, battle ropes today. It might be the first time you've ever done them, you know. Um, and, and of course, the instructor should have checked all of this beforehand as well. But it's nice to know just how you can check over a bit of kit to make sure that it's right. If you don't know how it should be, how do you know whether it's right or not? So... What we've got with a battle rope is essentially a big piece of, of heavy rope that will sort of loop around, pass around the back of something, and that will serve as like an anchor. So you've then got each end of the rope in your hand, and you can do different stuff with it to work different muscles. You know, what this person here looks like they're doing is single arm, slamming them, so lifting the rope, slamming it down as hard as they can. Yeah? Really good form of fitness, good shoulder burner, good form of cardio. Um, I, I absolutely love battle ropes, um, as challenging as they can be. Uh, same again, you want to make sure that your handles are right. So, you, of course, the handles have got a good grip. Well, you, your handles are nice and snug on the rope. So that as soon as you go whip, it's not going to come off and the rope's going to fly off and you've just left with a handle. Um, you want to check for rips. In that, in like sort of in the handle itself, make sure it's not going to again shred your hand, shred your palm. Um, maybe it's even check for rips in the rope itself. Make sure it's not just going to um, snap when you start using it. Check how the rope is attached and what it's attached to. You know, ideally you want it to be something that can't move. I've, I've, I used to put it around like the bottom of the squat rack, because the squat rack's quite heavy. It's got obviously weight plates on either side. I can try and pull that battle rope and that squat rack isn't going to move. If I went to just the little, little, like a, a little dumbbell tree that's got like a few weights either side and try to put my rope around that, as soon as I go and whip it, it's just going to pull everything forward. Yeah, it would pull that dumbbell tree over and there'd be dumbbells all over the place. So making sure that you've got it around something suitable um, and check for space as well. Of course, you don't just need the space that you're taking up, you need the space that the ropes are taking up as well. Um, you really need the space between you and where the rope is anchored, tied around something. That needs to be as clear as possible, doesn't it, really? You can't be whipping these ropes up and down if somebody's trying to be running past or, or, or walking over the top of them or something like that. So again, you need the space for battle ropes. Again, part of what I used to love about doing the boot camp before the gym was actually open um, was being able to get the battle ropes out and have as much space as we wanted, really, um, and really make the most of that. Um, then when you're done, um, same again, stored in a neat knot in a heavy duty storage container or hung up somewhere suitable. At the very least, somewhere to one side and out of the way. You don't want somebody to be, you don't want to leave it tied around the bottom of the, of the squat rack for somebody to come over with a 20 plate to go to put on one side of their squat and they trip over that, you know, and then and they're falling with a weight in their hand or, or whatever. Um, I'm going to hurt themselves that way, so... Um, making sure it's out the way, same as all of this kit, really, guys. Make sure it's out the way and nobody else can get hurt with it, uh, with it, buy it on it. Um, however, you want to look at it. 
Um, okay, so uh, last one that we're going to look at then, I believe. Yeah. Last one we're going to look at is going to be kettlebells. So kettlebell, we mentioned a little bit, this guy's demonstrating the kettlebell swing that we saw in one of our circuit cards earlier on. So that's a kettlebell swing. Um, and again, kettlebells, same as, um, I might as well mention it with medicine balls as well, actually. Medicine balls fall into the same category. Other stuff, not so much. Medicine balls and, and dumb, uh, medicine balls and kettlebells definitely go. So when it comes to picking a weight, Sometimes it can be a little bit tricky because with a dumbbell, with dumbbells, you might have a set of two kilograms, a set of three kilograms, a set of four kilograms, a set of five kilograms. So once you start to find one weight quite manageable, there's a, a reasonable next step for you. You can go from your two kilograms, you can go up to uh, three. Um. And, and then it's just like that next extra little step up, isn't it? Um, just be that little extra bit challenging. Um, and whereas with a kettlebell or a medicine ball, they don't grow up in such small increments. So they'll go up, um, you might have a two kilogram and the next one up might be a four, which isn't a massive leap, but it's double the weight. So then from there, you might get a six, a 12, an 18, a 24. So from, um, you're not going from like one weight just up to the next, it might be double, you know? So you might find that although one weight's a little bit easy, the next one might be, might be far too heavy. Yeah. So that's something to watch out for. Just because you've mastered or got used to one weight, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can manage the next weight up, which normally is going to be the case when you've got the opportunity to move up just a small amount. Um, the same as same as um, medicine balls as well. They um, might be filled with sand. Some of them are metal. Some of them are plastic. Um, certainly the plastic ones can, can, can crack. Um, and again, you've got sand coming out, potentially falling on you while you're doing an exercise. Um, and at the end of the day, it makes the kettlebell lighter as well. So if it says it's a 20 kilogram, but there's a load of sand leaked out of it, it's not going to be 20 kilograms anymore. Not so much a health and safety thing, but just a case of like, right, once once they've split, you know, it's maybe time to look to replace them. Um, so yeah, watch out, for, watch out for any cracks again as well, making sure that there's no sand falling out, either onto you, onto the floor, as well to be a bit of a, bit of a slip hazard as well. Um, check that the base has got a rubber, uh, check that the kettlebell's got a rubber base to protect the floor against whatever you're doing, putting it down, sort of maybe putting it down with a bit more gusto than you normally would, depending on what you're doing. Um, so yeah, just making sure that you're protecting the floor um, as well. And then like I sort of mentioned, make sure that the weight is suitable, um, but also make sure that, um, I guess you could also, again, make sure that the handle is nice and secure. You don't want to swing, the handle comes off, and you've got the kettlebell flying across the room either, same as a medicine ball. We don't, uh, we don't need it. Um, and then again, afterwards, when they're done, scored, uh, stored on a rack or in a suitable um, heavy-duty container. It's normally, um, again, normally sort of heavier ones at the bottom lighter ones at the top in case they do fall and the thing goes over. Um, and yeah, it just gets them off the, off the gym floor and, and there's less chance of somebody going over them or falling over them or, or something like that. Um, so yeah, like I say, when we're done with kit, let's get it out of the way, off the gym floor and uh, and make sure that, like I say, everybody's going to be, everybody around us is going to be safe. Um Okay, guys, cool. So just going to just gonna roll on then, and I'm just going to give you guys just a minute or two to um, reflect on this task. So thinking about um, what fitness equipment you're planning on using in your circuit and how the equipment might help with either muscular or cardio benefits. So just thinking about some of the equipment we've just looked at, um, start having a little bit of a think about some of the exercises you're planning on doing. Um,
I'll be just two seconds. So just while you have a little peek. Have you got some ideas now? Okay, guys. Okay, so hopefully we're starting to get a little bit of uh, a little bit of inspiration now, where we can start to have a think about what equipment we're going to be using. Um, maybe it's even what exercises you're going to start thinking about doing, and just what benefits they're going to um, those exercises are going to bring to uh, bring to people. So of course that points us towards um, our our next workbook task. Um, so sort of. We mentioned it in last week's session as well. So looking at the equipment that you'll use, how will it be used? What equipment will you do? And when it says this will be used because, you know, what benefit will it give? It'll help strengthen the shoulder muscles. It'll help with cardiovascular fitness or, or whatever. And um, so it even says at the bottom there, for your description, think about the exercises that will be carried out with the equipment. Also consider cardiomuscular benefits for, for why it's being used as well. Okay, that's cool. And then um, workbook 1.2, again, we looked at it last week, just identify two different safety precautions associated with each piece of equipment. So we've done most of those today. Um, I think the only one that we didn't include was probably cones and ladders. So try and think again for yourselves a little bit, think about some of the health and safety stuff that we have mentioned so far. There you go. Some of the health and safety stuff that we've mentioned this morning while we've been um, covering those and just think which applies maybe to ladders, cones and any other bits that you might think of. So two different safety precautions on each of those pieces of equipment. Um, and then we can move on to unit uh, section two. Yeah, 2.1 and 2.2. So um, identify three pieces of equipment and how you plan to... Um, use them and how you uh, plan to care and maintain for them as well. Yeah. So we've got, I want you to put a piece of equipment, ladders, you know, it, it might be, let's do, let's do dumbbells, care and maintenance, just check for splits, tears, check the handles. Um, where you sort of put them away when you're done with them, put them away. So care and maintenance, just um, check before use. Put them put a uh, put in a shelf or in a box when you're finished. Safety precautions might be, you know, look for loose bits, trip hazards, whatever. Sand might fall out of it, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, three pieces of equipment you intend to use, uh, how you plan to care and maintain them, and also the safety precautions as well. 
And that puts us right back through to our, um, of course, our examples from other learners as well. So again, yeah, I hope you've got lots of ideas today based on the, um, the circuit cards that we've looked at, you know, lots of different examples from different learners, different styles they've been done in. Um, and of course, and of course, we've looked at loads of different exercises the last couple of weeks now, either body weight or or otherwise. Um, just to, I guess, sort of grow our grow our um, exercise library. I guess our our exercise database. What exercises do we have in our repertoire to go to when we uh, when we're putting some circuits together? Like I say, if I was going to do one of my own, let's just do a quick little one before we finish up. I again would probably look at um let's have a look. Let's have a look. So if I was doing one, if I was going to do a circuit, again, thinking about the equipment that I've got, see if I wanted to do a little six session, a little six station circuit for myself in the house. I know I've got resistance bands. I know that my resistance bands are pretty good for upper body exercises and lower body exercises. So I might want to use a little bit of kit. So I'm going to do um, a circuit that just uses um, resistance bands and body weight circuit. Yeah, because that's what I've got available right now. So I might go um, exercise. Same again. Maybe write write me exercises down. So what am I what am I fancying? What stands out? So Russian twist is a core exercise. I'm going to do another core exercises. So I might do um, scissor kicks. Yeah. So then I'm going to want two. Um. In fact, let's have one for core. Let's have two lower body. So we're going to have reverse lunges. We're going to have crab walks with a band. So all you do, you put your resistance band around both the ankles and you do little side steps like a crab would. Yeah. Um, so right now that could be body weight, that could be body weight, that could be with the band. Um, and then I want two upper body exercises as well. So I might go um, press-ups and I might go hot hands. So you're in a plank position and you're doing... Shoulder taps. Yeah, you're in a plank and you're doing shoulder taps. Um, again, that's another body weight one. So I've got five exercises there. And then I'm also going to go with five cardio-based exercises as well. So those are those are more sort of muscle exercises. Um, so then, okay, I might want to go sort of cardio-based. So I might want to go with... Um, Let's go with high knees. We're going to go with burpees. We're going to go with skater jumps. Burpees go with um, mountain climbers, with fast mountain climbers, which can make it more of a cardio exercise than an abs exercise. So fast mountain climbers. Then for our last one, um, what we're going to have for the last one, let's go with one of the cardio-based one. Skip and rope. There we go. That sorts that out nicely. So we've got, obviously, that's going to be with a rope. So we've got two bits of kit um, in there, and then the rest of body weight. So we've got Russian twists, reverse lunges, crab walks, press-ups, and hot hands. So a core exercise, two lower body exercises, two upper body exercises, and five that you could probably argue are more cardio-based. So then you could go from one muscle exercise, so Russian twists for your abs, into high knees, get your heart rate up, more cardio. Into reverse lunges, we're back to a muscle exercise, then burpees, cardio again. Yeah, so that's the way that you could do it, you could alternate. That's just like a little example circuit there that you could do that we've kind of just done um, off the top of my head, really. Um, but there's so much out there. There's, that there's so much in terms of exercise and the way that you can even just structure things. You could do 
if you had 10 exercises, you could re rearrange it, those those same exercises to give a few different classes, um, depending on how they were structured and how they were put together. Um, Okie dokie, guys. Right. I will um, let you get away and enjoy the rest of your day or the rest of your evening, depending on whenever you might be watching this back. Um, so, um, bum, bum, bum. You just got that that uh, little slide up on the screen there for you, as always, just in case you did want to check, you know, come back and check what needs doing. Um over the next week, of course, you're going to start thinking about those circuit cards and getting some uh, get some stuff actually written down. Um, so like I mentioned at the start of the session, please don't forget to um complete the survey. Um, your feedback is important uh, to us as always. We like to know what we're doing well, where we can improve, and like I mentioned at the start of the session, um it actually helps us fill in some paperwork on your behalf as well. It saves us pestering you for that as well. Um, of course, like we've mentioned, uh, homework. Uh, so our plan for the next week is pages two to five in your tools and equipment workbook and beginning to design your circuit cards. Now we've got that workbook done. You should be able to, um, you know, we've got our exercises written down, what equipment we're going to use, how we've got our circuit. Yeah. Or we should be getting there with our circuit. What are your circuit cards actually going to look like? Yeah. Just do one, do a little template and just go from there. You know, get your first one done. Do you like it? Do you want to change some stuff? And then do your others so they look the same, like those examples that we looked at earlier on. Um, as always, guys, I'm just an email away. If you have any questions or you get stuck with anything, or there's anything that you need a little bit of a little bit of a hand with, um, we will of course be back next Monday. Um Let's just have a look. Uh, a little preview for next week's session. Eh? Let's have a little preview um, for next week. Let's have a look. So next week's session, we're week seven. We are going to be looking at um, muscles. We're going to be looking at um, Mainly skeletal muscles is where we're going to start next week. We're going to be looking at skeletal muscles, which is essentially um, the muscles that attach to our skeleton and um, allow us a lot of the movement that we do day to day. A lot of the muscles that we work in the gym, you know, things like our bicep, our abdominals, our quadriceps, our glutes, all of those. So we're getting a look at them next week, where they are, um, how they move, um, and yeah, uh, that is that is that is just one type of muscle that we have in the human body as well. So we will uh, we'll build on that in the in the following weeks as well. So skeletal muscles is to look forward to next week, guys. In the meantime, focus on those circuit cards. Let's try and start getting them moving. Um, whenever you're ready to, as always, just let me know, and I will um, I'll, we will get those one to ones booked in, um, and. You can talk me through your circuit cards as well, unless you just wanted to take pictures of them and email them over. Um, I'm more than happy for you to do that as well once they're done. You know, if you don't want to do the one-to-one -one Zoom and talk me through them, just send me pictures of them of them over. Um, just do all the ones that you've done. Um, okay then, guys. So thank you so much, as always, for logging in. Thank you for spending your time and learning with us at um, Media Savvy. Of course, if you want to know what's going on at headquarters in Sunderland, or if you want to stay up to date with like courses that are coming up, um, make sure to give us a little follow on uh, social media. Uh, until next, until next Monday, guys. Um, hope everybody stays safe. Look after yourself and everyone around you. Um, and we will be back next week to uh, to keep this ball rolling. Um, until then, guys, you know where I'm at. If you need me, um, stay safe, and I'll catch everybody next week. Take care.